It's time for Reflections of Grace Outreach Ministries, Thursday weekly discussion with Thomas and Denise. We are the walkers, inspiring souls and removing the mask through the word of God. Subscribe to us on our YouTube channel at Reflections of Grace Outreach Ministries and join our Anchor Podcast channel. And now join us for another enjoyable evening. God bless. Good evening and God bless each and every one of you for joining us tonight. My name is uh, Elder Thomas Walker, my wife, Minister Denise. She's away on assignment, but we pray that all is well and everything is going good with her in this day and time. We are so thankful and delighted that you have taken the time out to join us and to listen with us tonight. We are so glad that you uh, took the time again to, to just fellowship with us, to just discuss some things with us, you know, and I believe that tonight's discussion is going to be a very thoughtful and thought provoking one. Um, those that want to comment, please feel free to comment. It is, it is open forum. And if you're, you were willing to share, we are more than happy to have uh, your re response or your feedback. Um, this is Reflections of Grace Outreach Ministries, um, where we inspire souls and remove the mask through the word of God. And tonight's discussion, which I'm excited about, is called Shifting the Atmosphere. So what does that mean for us to shift the atmosphere. What is a shift? Um, what is um, incorporated in our atmosphere, our surroundings, who we associate with, who we socialize with? These are the things that, that we're gonna talk about tonight because um, the, the new year is coming around the corner and I wanna say happy holidays to everyone out there and everyone that's a part of this discussion tonight. We pray that you have a joyful time with family and friends. Be safe. Be sure to, to wear your mask and, and um, you know, keep ahead of social distancing and also the protocol of sanitizing and hygiene and, and keeping those things uh, up front because we have the we have the COVID and we have the flu and then we have RSV, all three viruses, um, trying to create what's called a cyclobomb or what they call it, you know, the snowball or the snow bomb that they talking about, uh, the bomb cyclone. That's what it is in the weather terms with the, the bad weather and all of the snow and the cold and the rain and everything. They call it a bomb cyclone. And we want you all to be safe and be be aware of of everything. You know, when you're going out visiting the family, be cognizant of of everything so that you can maintain health and get back home safely. And so, with that being said, I thank you all again for joining us. Again, um, I just I don't want to spend a lot of time tonight because I know a lot of people are probably out. Um, doing last minute things and 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 that's great. But I just had this this thought and the discussion to leave with you all on tonight. So as you move into your week and a weekend and a new year, maybe to have something um, concrete to to talk about and discuss with others or to just ponder on in your spare time. So. Um, you know, when we experience a shift in our lives, it, it often means that something has gone wrong or, or, or something resulted in a chaos. And when we shift our thinking, it is time that we decide to move or act differently than what we've done in the past. Our surroundings are important to our position and progress in the world. Also, our belief systems and faith play a large part in preparing and enduring change. When we feel alone or ostracized, we believe that no one cares. This is not true. We have soon and seen and witnessed 
God's divine providence in our lives. Yet, we may not always have known it, but it was there. You see, God provides so much for each of us, but it's sometimes sub subtle and it's sometimes not seen, it, it, but it's already been prepared for us in our future. It sometimes is necessary to shift our focus or our surroundings to become aligned with the will and purpose of God. Our, one example in the Bible, and that's that everyone should be familiar with, is where God spoke to a man named Abram. He told this man to leave the country and he was to settle to in a place and position to be blessed. That's what God told him. And not only was he told that he would be blessed, God also made a covenant with him to bless his offspring. You know, God's plan for us has great opportunities for elevation and happiness, but are we ready to make that change? Are we ready to shift our atmosphere and trust God for our future? You know, it's, it's scary. It's scary. I know it's scary. And it sometimes would be the unknown. But with God, we have to believe that all things are possible. You know, shifting the atmosphere means that we are making a choice to step aside out of our, our comfort zone and, and try to allow change for the better. However, we must, you know, we must be willing to trust the Lord with all of our heart and lean not to our own understanding. You know, the shift is good when God is included in the decision making. So where are we in our shift and where are we in our atmosphere? Where does God play a part of? Where do we invite God in our decision making process? You know, I, I was thinking about a time when I had to make decisions, you know, to join the military. And that was a hard decision to make because I had a, a, the my goal process or my milestones or my future already lined out to um, go to school, become a physician assistant, and uh, work in the medical field. But, you know, I had to make the choice because um, I found out that the, the young lady that I was uh, dating, she became pregnant. So the shift <laughs> that, that happened in my life was very, very paramount. Now, I had to make the decision, well, do I go to school and finish up my education or do I take the responsibility of um, providing for and becoming more family oriented and laying aside what I wanted to do for me and focus on what was necessary and needed? Well, I, I'm here to say that I did focus on what was needed and I joined the military and I was 19 years old at that time. And 19 is not a good time to, to have a baby and in the military at the same time. I'm just gonna I'm just gonna put that out there. <laughs> you know, <laughs> there was a lot of hard knocks and a lot of choices that that I wasn't ready for. And there was a lot of shifts that I wasn't prepared to handle. And what is a shift? A shift is a slight change in position, direct, direction, or tendency. Now, some people might call a shift a slight change, but when you're shifting from um, teenhood to adulthood, when you're going from living in mama's house to having to provide a house, when you're going from, are you thinking about a schoolwork? to try and figure out where you're going to work at and have enough money in the house to provide for you and a, a, a spouse and a baby. 
Well, then that shift is not slight. That is a large, that is a paramount, that is almost an insurmountable uh, change and shift in a person's life when they're not prepared for it. And that's why we need something other than ourselves to lean on. That's what the Bible tells us in Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. You know, lean not to our own understanding. What that means, not leaning to our own understanding, means we're going to make mistakes and we're going to believe deep down in our heart that we're doing the right thing. And for us, most, many of us, you know, doing the right thing is the only thing that we know. You know, I've, I've had often conversations with people that always said, well, common sense should have told this person that or common sense should have told that other person that. And I had to ask one person one time, what was common sense? And they said, well, common sense is what everybody know. It's, it's what you what you learn when you was a kid. It's what you you experienced when you was younger that everybody knows. You know, don't, don't nobody tell you how to breathe. Don't nobody tell you how to get up in the morning. Well, yeah, that's true, but that don't make it common sense. <laughs> Those are natural things that, that normally happen by God's grace that you wake up in the morning and you're breathing. You know, we have no control over that. That's all in, in, in divine providence that those things happen. But the decisions that we make, those, the decisions we make, uh, make that sense common. Well, let's think about it. Okay. If, if you were a rich person and you've never been without food, water, or shelter, and you've never had to rely on getting a job, you know, of your common sense in that time and in that instance for yourself is, well, I'll just call the maid or, well, dad will just hang on, handle the, the, the expenses or, well, all I have to do is get up and breakfast is already made for me. You know, those are the common sense things that they know. So when they get into those situations where they have to provide for themselves and 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 feed themselves and work for themselves, you know, there's a lot of things that they don't know. Now you see Joe Snuffy. See, Joe Snuffy had to work hard. He he didn't have, he was a latchkey kid. His his mom and father both worked outside of the home. And when he got home, he had to fend for himself and find breakfast. So he became resourceful on how to manage and maintain and 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 basically take care of himself while he was still living with. His parents. Now, on the other hand, you got, um, you know, the rich guy. You know, he he have he've never had to have that experience. To that, he woke up and it was all presented to him. So when somebody tells that rich guy, well, common sense really told you to put in a resume, you know, if you wanted a job. Well, you know, he never had to put in a, a job for, you know, a resume for a job. So that's not common for him. My point of saying this is. A lot of people misconstrue the fact that, okay, since you live in the same city as I live in, or if you're the same age I live in, that we all experience the same things. And that's not true. And if that's not true, we tend to stigmatize people for their, uh, I'm not going to say naivety, but their inability to you know, uh, collaborate or have commonalities with you when something happens. You know, that's why when we encounter people or we come, come, uh, come up to people and meet people for the first time, we should not have presuppositions or preassumptions about who they are, or we shouldn't have stereotypes about what they are and who they are and what they do. And we assume these things positively or negatively about someone we meet for the first time. See, we have to, we have to shift our mindset. We have to change how we look at life and things in the natural. Now, let's talk about things in, in as far as when we're encountering people. I'm going to say this. If you're dating somebody and you come across this guy 
or this female. And they're sitting there, they're presented all nicely and they look great and they look like they're going somewhere in life. And you see that and, and I mean, the eyes, man, your eyes get you in trouble because that's, that's fine, that's sexy, that's handsome, that's beautiful, that's gorgeous, that's refined, that's ladylike, that's gentlemanly, like, you know, you have all those outwardly qualities that you're seeing with your eyes. But, you know, that's enticing you. You're feeling good. You're feeling confident that you're meeting the right person at the right time in the right place. Yes, your, your eyes are big. Your, your, your heart is open and receptive. But then when you sit down and have conversation with that person, oh, that's where the disappointment comes in at. Because your expectations of what they presented to you was one way. But when they actually began to interact with you, it was completely different. And that's sometimes what we have to do in our lives when we meet people for the first time or we endure things for the first time. It's easy to get uh, stuck in a situation or pigeonholed into something that we're it, you know, we assumed that was going to be correct for us, and we continue to move forward in it and in the hopes that it's going to get better, in the hopes that you could change that person, in the hopes that if I work long enough or stay here long enough and prove myself on this job, that they would give me a promotion and a raise, or if if I if I stick with this relationship, even though this guy curses at me, even though he uh, belittles me, even though he doesn't have a heart for me, or, or even though this guy even beats on me, I, I believe I can make a difference. He's, I just have to understand him. And if once I understand him, I'll know how to please him. Just like with the woman, I mean, that you know, you have these relationships where it's one-sided, you know, and you have these these instances where people are being taken care, taken advantage of. You know, when does the shift come in? When does the slight change uh, in position come? See, the position that that we want to change is in our mind and in our hearts. And that positional change has to come from us. First, loving ourselves. First, we have to love ourselves enough to say, hey, this is this is not what I signed up for. Hey, this is not, you know, everything that I thought. That this is not where I wanted my life to be at this point and stage in life. See, we have to shift the atmosphere that we're living in. Well, let's, let, what's the atmosphere, secondly? Well, uh, uh, it's our surroundings uh, and, and where we live at. And, and, and if we look up the definition of a surrounding, it's the circumstances, the conditions or objects by which one is surrounded. So that's our atmosphere. A lot of people can have atmospheres that are, are happy, peaceful, joyful. And there are some that would have painful, violent, or uh, miserable atmospheres to where it causes mental health issues. And that's what God wants us to change. God wants us to change our natural situations, our natural uh, problems and circumstances, and our surroundings so that he can talk to us so that we can find peace and comfort, that we can we can rely and trust in him for our present and our future. You know, the Bible says um, in Ecclesiastic third set, chapter in the first verse, it tells us, you know, to everything there's a season, a time for every purpose under the heavens. Well, it, what what he what what we were talking about in that scripture is there's a time and a place for basically everything. But for us, when does that time come for us to change? When does that time come for us to 
uh, like Teddy Pendergrass says, you got to let it go because it's a love TKO. When do you let those things go? When do you give up? When do you say, okay, this is not healthy for me anymore or any longer, and I have to do something differently, you know, and, and, and there's a time and a season. Sometimes we are placed in situations and circumstances in our surroundings to learn from them, to learn from the mistakes or to learn from others' mistakes. And we have to be willing to shift our mindset from I know everything to, hey, I need to be taught some things. I need to be quiet and be still so that I can take notes so that I don't fall in that same pit or that same circumstance as a, the other person did that I'm looking at. So there's a time to everything and there's a season to everything, meaning you're going to go through rough times and you're going to take a lot of opportunity. And there's going to be a lot of times where you're going to have to shift. You're going to have to change. You're going to have to move. You're going to have to release some things. You're going to have to grab a hold to some things. There's the, that's that season for that. See, Sometimes people want to have a, a, always a season of blessings and prosperity. And when you hear that all the time, you know, you have some people, they start talking about, yeah, God has, is a, he own a cat on a thousand hills that's his and, and the blessings of the, the Lord is on my life and everything like that. But at the same time, what season are you in? Are you in a season of of thanking God? Are you in a season of worshiping God? Are you in a season of, of blessing others? You know, th there is a precedence in the Bible and everywhere where it's more blessed to give than to receive. So how many people have shifted their mindset to the point where they're more willing to give than to receive? See, this is the Christmas season and, and everybody's out Fa la 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 and and if they're they're exchanging gifts, buying presents for their loved ones, and they're they're in a joyful, uh, festive, a uh, giving spirit, which is great, you know, during the Christmas season. Now, when um, December twenty sixth <laughs> through uh, December the first come back around, <laughs> the next year, you know. Is that shift still there? Are you still willing to give? Are you still willing to be a blessing to others? Are you still willing to, to make a change? You know, another thing that, um, that God says, you know, um, in the Bible, it says, be strong and of good courage. Do not fear nor be afraid of them. For the Lord your God, he is the one who goes with you. He will not leave nor forsake you. Now, God is telling us to be a good cheer, be a good spirit, be be uh, 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 be happy because every, every perfect gift comes from God. Okay, if God is, is in us to be a blessing to others, then the gift that we should give to others in our lives. It doesn't necess necessarily have to be monetarily or tangible. It could be gifts of emotions, gifts of, of support for those that are going through situations. If you know someone in your family that are going through a tough time, it's time for you to shift the way you're thinking about that person and, and show empathy and compassion toward it him or her. And even if they're living a lifestyle that you're not pleased with, the shift has to always come, a change, a slight change in your position, meaning love and kindness will draw a multitude of people. And if you're loving on a person, even though you might not like what they're doing, even though you might not like the life that they're living, you know, that would make all the difference in the world to, to reach out to someone that you know needs love, needs compassion, need empathy. And you know those people, those people are in your life. But where does the shift comes from in you to where you want to make a difference, make a, 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 a effort 
to show someone else that you care, to show someone else that you you can still love on them and love on who they are, even though you have differences of opinions on some things. You know, it took me 50 something years to understand that. You know, I'm I'm 57 now. I'll be 58 real soon, like in a matter of three months. But it took me a long time to realize that, you know, as long as I do what I'm supposed to do, as far as showing empathy, compassion, loving on a person, being there for a person, supporting them, and and trying to make a difference in a person's life. If I'm up to doing that, if I can do just that much, then I've done more than most. And I didn't turn my back and I didn't look sideways or make another person feel uh, ostracized or rejected. So it's important for us to change our surroundings and change the way we think about of things. God says that every good gift uh, and every perfect gift come from the above. See, God touches our heart to be able to do those things because if you see someone out there that are going through a struggle or situation or experiencing trauma or domestic violence, you know, God will lay on your heart to to, to do something, to say something, to, you know, step in as best that you can to try to help. And that's what, that's, that's God leading you to provide that good and perfect gift for that person in that moment, in that season. I mean, you don't have to, to, to feel as if you're taking on that person's uh, problems or responsibilities, because God is, he will work with you and let you know what it is that he requires for you to do in that circumstance or that situation. So we should always be in a place where that, that we are listening to God. We are listening to his instructions when we're going through or encountering people that we know or, or see on the street. It's important for us to show and have that love and exude that, that faith that we believe that God is telling us to do something real and new. And um, the next scripture that I want to talk about is how God can change us and in from the inside out. And there's a way that God does these things, meaning that he reaches deep down in our hearts and he began to touch those little areas that has empathy, that has compassion, that has, you know, the, the desire to want to do right and do well by others. And, and God wants people to be receptive for that and be prepared to live in that moment of, of change. And God has a, a plan and purpose for everybody on this earth. We just have to be willing and able and ready to listen and hear his voice and be open with our heart and our mind and our spirit to follow what he says. You know, and this is what God says. He says, um, behold, I would do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth. Shall you not know it? I will even make a road in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. Isn't that special? Now, what that means is, see, God wants to do a new thing in your life. God wants to, to, to take you from one situation, which may be bad, to a better situation with him. A better situation knowing that he was the one that moved that situation out of your life to a better circumstance. He said, I'll do a new thing. He said, don't you know I can, I can do those things? I can get you out of that situation. I, I, can, I can raise you up where you might be falling down. I can provide all of your needs for you. I can protect you when, when you need protection. God is saying these things, and this is what we want people to understand and know. This is what we should be telling others, the trust in God. Trust in God when you have situations that come up that's, that's out of your control. 
<laughs> you know, God wants to do these new things in your life, but you have to have some sort of relationship with him. You have to, number one, know that God is the creator. Number two, that God can do all things. Number three, that God, nothing is impossible with him. And the fourth and final thing, that God loves you that God loves you and he wants to have a relationship with you. When you understand those things, that God can do all, he sees all, he knows all, and he loves you, and he wants to do a new thing in your life. He's saying, I can do a new thing. Don't, don't you know that? Just call on me. Come to me and I will be there for you. And like we talked about in this the, the second verse of Deuteronomy 31, he said, I would not leave you nor forsake you. See, God doesn't want to leave anyone in, on their own devices. He said it is, it's, it's not his will that no man should perish, but to come to repentance. And what does repentance mean? Repentance is just like change. It means Turn, turn away from those things that are keeping you rebellious away from God's purpose and plan for your life. So when we are shifting the atmosphere and who we are, where we are, where we're going, who we are surrounded with, and the chances that we are taking in life, there has to be something or a template that we need to follow to ensure that things are going to work out all right. And that's what God says in Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. He says, trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Lean not to your own understanding, but in all your ways, acknowledge God and he would direct your paths. Wow, isn't that something? Now, let's, let's look at this. God is making a, a road in the wilderness and a river in the desert. Now he's directing your path. He's doing all these things. He's, he, he doesn't want you to be to perish, but to come to repentance. Now, how is he doing all these things for us? Well, you know, shifting our atmosphere means we got to get sick and tired of being sick and tired. We got to get tired of going through the same situation and handling the same things and uh, following the same plan and obtaining the same result. We got to get tired of doing the same thing over and over and over and getting the same results. A lot of people, they are, they, they are very, you know, sometimes we get into situations where we fill out applications, we put in resumes, and we look for jobs, but we're looking for jobs in the same place. We're looking for jobs that we believe that we are qualified for. We put in application resumes, and, and we expect that perfect job to call us when they never call. So what do you do? Instead of shifting and changing the focus and doing something different, you sit there and you fester and you sit there and you begin to allow the enemy to, to talk negative things in your life to tell you, oh, see, you don't have enough experience to get that job. Or who do you think you is that that you can get the make fifty thousand or twenty thousand dollars a year? You don't want to went to high school or you would you're a high school dropout or you're a college dropout or you only got a four-year degree. How are you going to make that amount of money? See, that's the trick of the enemy telling you. And that's your surrounding right there when you're in your own place and the enemy starts talking to you and negativity starts to breed inside of you to crush and to steal who you are meant to be on this earth. See, God says in his word that he would never leave us nor forsake us. But we have to be at that place where we're saying, come ye, all ye are heavy laden and heavy burning, and I will give you rest. That's what Jesus is saying to us. Jesus is telling us that he will give us rest from all those situations and, and, and those negative um um, thoughts and, and inclinations that come up in our minds and in our heart. But then again, people say, well, you know, I don't believe in God. I don't believe in Jesus. I, I, I believe in, in myself and what I can do for myself. Well, that's 
that's your prerogative to be that way or to feel that way. But then let's look at it. The, 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 that's like 10, 15, 20% of the people in the world that in their own strength, they were able to attain X, Y, Z. But what about the other 80% that in their own strength, it has went sideways for you and it continuously going sideways and negative to the point where you feel dejected or to the point where you feel as if there's no hope. Some of that 80%, some of them lose hope and they give up and some give up and they do their drastic things to eliminate the pain of feeling like they're failures. Well, I'm here to tell you, Jesus is here. <laughs> he, he loves us and he cares for us and he wants to have a relationship with you. You see, God says in Numbers 23, now, he says this because he said he, he'd do new thing in us. He said that he would make road in a real wilderness and a river and a desert and that all things are possible and that he, he can make all things good, a perfect gift. Now, this is what he says in the Bible. The Bible says this about God's character. It says, God is not a man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should repent. He, has he said and will he not do? Or has he spoken and will he not make it good? Now, see, God is, is telling you that he's not a man that he should lie. That means whatever he's, he's promised or said in his word or to you as a person, he's not a man that it's gonna, it's gonna fall to the wayside or you go get it wrong. If God showed you and told you that you would be blessed, then you have to walk it out in faith. The Bible tells us faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. Just because you might not have gotten that job today or this week or this month and that job has not materialized the way you want it, that doesn't mean that God doesn't have another job out there for you. That means you got to continue to walk in faith. That means you got to shift the way you're thinking when you're sitting on that couch and you, you don't get a phone call. That means you got to get up and you got to do something. You know, if God said that he's going to bless you, if God said that he's your father and, and he has a cat on a thousand hills and he can bless anything and he can do all things, he's not a man that his word should lie or his word should return void. That means come back empty. That means you put your trust in him and it didn't work out. Now you stuck in the worst position. Well, for those that have experienced that, when you just reach out and you claim that you are trusting God and you pray to God, but you didn't get the job. Well, you have to look at what have you been doing? I mean, uh, what slight changes have you done or have you presented to God in your life to show them, to show him that that you are on board with whatever he does. See, that comes with trust in the Lord with all your heart. Now, if you're praying to God and saying, God, I really need this job. I really want to be married. I really want a good man. I really want a good wife. Or I don't want to struggle no more. God, help me. You know, you're saying that that's a blanket. That's a specific request that you're giving God. But at the same time, what are you doing to find out who God is, how God understands, how his his uh, uh, character is, and what does he desire from us? See, because a lot of us want God to be as a genie. You can call gene, call God up and you ask God for something and, and God will just fire it off right there for you, right then and there. And you say, oh, I believe God now because God answered my prayers. But are you in that position to where that you are saying, God, even if you don't give it to me, I thank you anymore because you have surely done more than enough than I could ever want or desire or need. 
See, that's what God wants to see. He wants to see humility. He doesn't want to see anger or frustration. He wants to see humility. He wants to see the fact that even though it might not work out the way you want it to go, or make not, you know, things might not go the way you plan it to go in your own strength. God said, trust in him with all your heart and lean not to your own understanding. So when we are shifting our atmosphere, that means we are able and willing to let go and let God take over. But in the meantime, while we're allowing God to, to take over, we have to start filling in some of the areas where we believe God would be pleased with us and, and so that he can see that we are, are uh, able to be blessed and be good stewards over the blessings that he has given us. See, it's not about give or take. And it's not about, okay, I call God, God answer me and I'm going to get blessed. And it works that way because it doesn't work that way. We have to find ourselves and put ourselves in a, in a position to be blessed by God. And the only way that that can happen is if we believe that Jesus died for our sins and then we believe that he, he died on the cross so that we may be redeemed and reconciled back to God. And see, the whole concept of Jesus dying on the cross for our sins and, and him being the son of God is, is kind of flaky for a lot of people because they say, well, what kind of man could be married? I mean, could, could be born of, of Mary uh, and Joseph, and he becomes the, the son of God, and he could claim that he could die for our sins. That's not That's not relevant. That's not possible. Well, the Bible has already told us with God, all things are possible. So it's a belief. It's a trust factor. If we believe that Jesus died for our sins and believe that he is the son of God, what's wrong with asking him? What's wrong with living a life that, that mirrors Jesus' teaching? What's wrong with loving people uh, being there for people that are, are hurting or downtrodden. You seen in the Bible, and we hear stories from National Geographic and everywhere how Jesus performed these miracles, how he healed these people, how he presented himself, how he taught about the blessings. You know, all of these things Jesus were uh, instrumental in teaching the people of that day. And we are blessed to have those teachings and writings and those situations are written down for us to utilize as a template to show that, you know, we can live like that and we can still be a blessing to others when we shift our mind and our hearts to want to do things in, in order and in love to other people. Now, the Bible tells us Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. That means the spirit of, of God, the spirit of Jesus, you know, his teachings is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Love thy neighbor as thyself. Love God with all your whole heart, strength, and mind. You know, those are the teachings you know, that, that Jesus had instilled on the earth. Those are the greatest two commandments. Love God with all your whole heart, strength, mind, and love thy neighbor as thyself. Because when you're loving your, your neighbor as yourself, you're not going to want to commit adultery. You're not going to sin against yourself. You're not going to murder yourself. You're not going to covet yourself. You're not going to do the detestable and damnable things if, if you had to do it to yourself. So that's why when you love your neighbor as yourself, that means you're going to treat a person the way you want to be treated. And you're going to be there for someone just like you want them to be there for you if that was a situation that you needed help. So when we're talking about these things, these living the life of a believer in Jesus is, is really practical and really easy to do. Now, we're going to say that you're going to need some different different tools to go by when you're living a life 
that you want to mirror Jesus's life. And, and this is in 2 Corinthians, the fifth chapter and the 17th verse. It says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, which is Jesus, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away and behold, all things have become new. <laughs> wow, that is, that is something to really think about. If any man, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation, meaning your shift has become permanent. <laughs> your change and your shifting in your atmosphere has switched from being downtrodden, being a person that that is uh, harming your body with, with with bad things that you're doing on this earth, and you're shifting and you're taking control of the way that you treat your body, the way that you feel mentally and physically and emotionally, and you are making a conscious effort to present your body as a a, a living sacrifice. Or if you're in Christ, you're a new creation. Meaning when you're in Christ and you're being a new creation, that means the way you think about seeing that homeless man over there isn't in a way where you're going to say, oh, I'm just going to give him some money. He's just going to spend it on drugs. Or I'm not going to give him anything because he should go out and get his own job. See, God, God does not want us to have that mindset. You know, he says, love thy neighbor as thyself. Now, if you were in that situation and where you was homeless or you was on the street, you would want and look and need for somebody to stop and help you where you needed help. So treat people the way you want to be treated. And that's the love out of the love of God. The brotherly love, the neighborly love, that's what God wants each and every one of us to incorporate in our lives. But we can't get that way unless we become a new creation. And a new creation means that we have to relearn and re refocus what and how we want to present ourselves to the world. And the best way to do that is understanding the teachings of Jesus, understanding how he walked and moved in this world to the place where when we encounter um, a person that's on the street, a person that has uh, done uh, sinful things or uh, like the woman in adultery, instead of Jesus judging that, that woman, he said, if anyone among you, if without sin, cast the first stone. See, all of them has sinned. And they were ready to stone the lady to death because they found her in adultery. But what did he do? He didn't pick up a rock. He didn't pick up a brick and was ready to do that. What he did, he wrote on the ground and he told them, if any of you all are without sin, cast the first stone. And they all held their head down and they walked away. See, that's the way God wants us to be. We, he wants us to acknowledge that we were once there, or we are still works in progress there, but we're turning our lives around. We're shifting who we are. We're changing our atmosphere, and we're changing how we handle situations and circumstances that come up in our lives. See, just because you live with a person, and that person was mean and, and abusive to you, you know, that does not mean that when you are in a twine or in 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 a, in a relationship with someone other than that person as you moved on that you become the abuser and you become that person that abused you and see sometimes people don't know any better and they tend to uh what we say nowadays pull that baggage in to that new relationship and the way that you were treated with that person, you began to start lashing out at the new person. Then that new person has to tell you, hey, hey, wait a minute. I'm not that person. <laughs> don't take that out on me. I don't know, you know, what, what you're thinking, but this is me. This is who I am. And see, that's what, what God wants us to get to see in ourselves. You know, all those old things and the old problems that, that you had 
endured and things and search situations that you have encountered. God wants you to give that account in your life to say, hey, I am tired of living this way. I am tired of being tired. I'm tired of being uh, mean, angry, uh, uh, resentful, you know, uh, always biting back at people. I'm tired of living in anger and, and turmoil. I want change. I want a better life. I want to feel differently. I don't want to feel depressed and angry and, and anxious all the time. I don't want to feel insecure or isolated all the time. I need to step out and change. And the best way that we can do that is to get in alignment with people, places, and things that makes a difference in a positive way in our lives. That's how we make that shift. And the best way that you can make that shift as well is to begin to find out and build a relationship with God. And I'm not saying this to proselytize or anything like that, but if you read the Bible, and I'm just going to, we read a lot of books. We read, uh, read Harlequin. We read other books, you know, these uh, self-help books. We read so many books in the world about uh, self-love, self-help, self-this and self-that, encouragement, affirmation books, inspirational reading that helps, helps us to, you know, uh, encourage ourselves when we're down. Let's try reading the Bible. Let's let's try reading the Bible because uh, there are so many things in the Bible that you can read and begin to learn the mannerism of God, the character of God, the teachings of of Jesus to the place where in the Book of Proverbs. Wow, if you took the time just to read the book of Proverbs by itself, it's a wealth and wealth and wealth of knowledge, of moral, character, ethics, and, and how, to, how to govern ourselves. Just in that one particular book, Proverbs, you would be able to find out how God desires for us to treat one another and how God desires for us to act and um, relate to each other and have relationship with one another. Take the time to read the book of Proverbs and you would see, you know, that those things are so helpful. And that all these things, are, what I'm saying, is going to help you shift your atmosphere. If you're going through situations and pain and problems today, now is the time to make that change. Now is the time to shift. That means to change. That means to, to move your circumstances and the conditions. Move that out of the way that, that you're not pleased with. And start to incorporate something differently. See, the Bible says, uh, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. See, that's it's not saying that you need to drink the proverbial Kool-Aid. It's not saying that you need to um, become sanctimonious or or so high up in your your belief and your thought process that God can't use you, that you can't be effective on this earth. What it's saying, uh, present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Meaning, God wants you to give your best to him. I know a lot of places that we call churches and stuff, they have this high expectation of code of conduct and everything like that because they believe that a person that's holy is supposed to live on this high pinnacle of, of that no one can really achieve. Well, if that's the case, then aren't you placing yourself as closely to God as possible? Or, or, or are you trying to show people that 
if you could live a life that's pleasing to God with your reasonable service, meaning that you're doing the best that you can, that you are shaped in iniquity, first of all, and you're going to make mistakes and you're going to have situations and you're going to have problems that come up that you're not going to be able to really deal with on your own. That's why it goes back to the scripture we talked about. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not to your own understanding, but in all your ways, acknowledge God and he would direct your paths. That means when you're getting in a situation, when you're trying to live a life pleasing to God, and you know that those are temptations and vices out there that you struggle with, that you're trying to, to, to stay away from, that you're trying to remove out of your life, that you're making that, that conscious shift away from those things that you used to do that you don't do no more. Your reasonable service to God, your very reasonable service is to have a mind and a heart to not displease God or to, to sin against God. That's what sin is, rebellion. That means that you are going against what God wants us to be and who he wants to, to be in our lives on this earth. He desires for us to be a representative of his purpose, of his plan, of his love, his kindness, and his statutes. So when we are in that way, when we are living according to our reasonable service to God. That means God knows our heart. He already knows what you're dealing with. He already knows what your struggles are. He already knows when you're going to make the mistake when you make it. Therefore, if you know all these things and you're trusting God with all your heart and leaning not to your own understanding, but in all your ways, acknowledge God and he will direct your path. Now, this is the great part about it. When he is directing your path, that means he's going to send you a comforter, a teacher, which is the Holy Spirit, to indwell within you. That's going to show you and going to ward you off from those situations that's going to come up. Now, you know if Joe Snuffy going to call you at, at one o'clock in the morning talking about, hey, girl, what's up? Uh, I just want to come by there for a little while and, and hang out. Now, we know that all intents and purposes, at one o'clock in the morning, somebody calling you, you know what they want. Well, see, you already know that that's, that might be one of those, uh, those weak points that you might have because, you know, Joe Snuffy might be, you know, all that in a bag of chips, but you're trying to live a life that's different from that now. Now you're trying to shift from that. So now what you do when Joe Snuffy calls, Instead of saying, oh, in myself, oh, yes, come on over. And, you know, knowing that what the outcome is going to be. Now you have to acknowledge God and he will direct your path. Now you can say, God, what should I do? How should I handle this? This is a, a stronghold. This is something that I enjoy doing. Now, how do I get out of this? And God, you know what I got to tell you? you say, just say no. Just say, no, you ain't about that no more. You're trying to live for God. You're trying to live a life that pleases God. And let your yes be yes and your no be no. And the guy's going to get upset. He's going to get mad. He's going to talk about you. But that's what they want. Because, see, they remember who you were and who you used to be. You know, the good time girl, the, 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 the drinking buddy. All of those things, they remember those things about you because y'all had commonalities. But now since you are presenting yourself a, a, a living sacrifice <laughs> and holy, which is your reasonable service, see, now they don't understand that because they haven't got that memo. They haven't got that revelation. They haven't um, taken the time out to make that shift in their atmosphere. But see, you did. And by you doing that, you're going to you're going to face opposition and people are going to come against you. Those friends that you had, you know, <laughs> woo. like I said, the shift is good when God is included in the decision making. See, it's not going to be good for a lot of people because they're not going to understand the new you. But God is going to be 
in a place, in a position where he's going to buffer those things that come against you, that he's going to give you peace. And you're going to have that peace knowing that you're not alone. You're not by yourself just because your friends and stuff turning back on you. You're going to know that God gives you a peace that surpasses all your understanding. And that's what God wants us to remember and know moving forward in our lives. We have to get to the place where we're not afraid to step out on change, that we're not afraid to let those old things go. We're not afraid to trust in God with all of our heart and not pick those things back up to try to make a difference before God has intervened. It has to come from our heart. It has to come from us making that change. And that making that change means we're willing to let go and let God. And that's the, the, the whole purpose of shifting our atmosphere. We have to be willing to let go and let God. Let him take the wheel. You know, I, the you old song, you say, Jesus, take the wheel. You know, <laughs> guide me on my way. But what I'm saying to you is very simple. In the new year, 2023, if you want change, if you want something different, you have to begin by shifting how you think about your life. What are the things that you're, you're doing and enjoying now that you're attaining the same results? Are you willing to make that change? Are you willing to shift? Are you willing to incorporate something other and greater than yourself, which is God's teaching? which is God's understanding, is knowing and learning who he is, and then willing, become willing to shift and change your way of thinking and trust him. And I promise you, in this new year, if you take that opportunity and take that, that chance to make that change, you will see a difference immediately. You will see a difference for the good and for the bad. And I'm meaning for the bad is that when you make that change, your people that the people that used to hang out with you, they're going to be mad at you. They're going to be upset with you. They're going to try to, to tempt you or entice you. They're going to be angry with you. And, and you got to be OK with that because you're making a change for the better for you. And if they can't follow along and you can't be that example of change for them then God is going to put you in a place where change and people are going to come and they're going to love on you and they're going to support your change and they're going to be there and help you through those rough times. So don't worry about change. Don't worry about shifting the atmosphere. God is with you. He says, yea, though I walk through the valley of the sh shadow of death, I will fear no evil for Thou art with me. That's what David said. And that's what we have to remember. When it gets rough, when it gets tough, after we've shifted out of our atmosphere, we have to believe and know that God is there with us, regardless of how hard it might look or feel, because it's only going to be temporary. Your hard times and your bad times are only going to be temporary because the adversary wants to still kill and destroy your new change. So don't allow that to happen. Because when we know better, we do better. And only what we do for God is going to last. Amen. So thank you all for joining us tonight. I, I pray that everyone have a, a safe holiday season, a safe fellowship with their family and friends. I pray that you all have received something from the, the lesson tonight. I just want you all to know that God loves you. And God cares for you and God wants to be in your life. He wants to make a difference in your life. All you have to do, make that decision to call out to him, to cry out to him with your whole heart and lean not to your own understanding. Amen. So we thank you and we God bless you. And I want you all to have a safe holiday and a very, very great new year. So I'm going to leave with a, a closing prayer. Father, we thank you for the day. We thank you that you have been so good to each and every one of us on this call. We thank you that you have, have kept us 
all through this year that you have provided for us, that you have made a way for us when we didn't see no, no way for us to make a way. You were there, Lord. We thank you, Father, for the job. We thank you, Lord, for the home or the apartment or the place where we can lay our head. We thank you, Father, for our family members and friends that have a heart for us. And Father, we thank you also for those that don't have a heart for us because you are showing us. You are showing us that we need you, that we need you to lead and guide us into all truth. And Lord, we ask you to heal our bodies where they may be sick. We ask you to continue to strengthen our minds where we may be weak. We ask you, Heavenly Father, to continue to, to hold us up and lift us up and help us to make the change necessary to follow you daily and to call you our God and us your people. We ask you, Heavenly Father, those things that are coming against us, we plead the blood of Jesus over it. And we ask you to, to cast it away from us and create in us a new heart and renew the right spirit within us. Those under the sound of my voice, if you're going through situations or struggles, we ask you, Heavenly Father, to touch their hearts, to reach out to them and send your angels to comfort them and to reveal yourself in their lives that they know that you are there and you love them and spirit spite of everything. Lord, we know no weapon formed against us shall prosper, and we believe and trust that you are with us in our weakest moments and in our greatest moments. And for that, we give you glory, honor, and praise. We ask you, Heavenly Father, as we go through these, the rest of this year and the rest of these days, that you be with us, that you shield us and our family members and our friends and our loved ones and keep us safe. We love you and we bless your name. And these and all the blessings we are asking your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen, everyone. So you all have a, a great and wonderful night. And also uh, feel free to uh, look at, we I just published a new book entitled The Vacuum Effect, Surviving the Shift When It Happens. It's available on Amazon.com and it's in Kindle format. So if you take the time out and you feel inclined to read something new this year before the year is out, please feel free to reach out and, and download the book or, or purchase the book. Again, it's called The Vacuum Effect, Surviving the Shift when it happens. And it's a very, a very good book that talks about the physical, mental, and spiritual things that, that come against us in our lives that causes shifts to happen, that causes things to change the dynamics of where we are and where we're going. So I talk about some of the remediations and some of the things that, that we can utilize to help us through those situations. So I pray that you enjoy it and pray that you take the time to purchase a, a book or download it from the Kindle um, and, and be blessed. And I look forward to your feedback or your comments or, or whichever way. Again, this is Thomas Walker. Uh, and the book is uh, under Thomas E. Walker and uh, Reflections of Grace Outreach Ministries. And I thank you all. Um, feel free to reach out to us by email or, or phone call or text. Thank you so much. And you have a, a blessed rest of the night. Happy holidays. And we'll speak again soon. When a vacuum effect happens, it causes free space filled with love, kindness, and innocence to become filled with negativity, trauma, anger, and insecurities. The vacuum effect, surviving the shift when it happens, tells how each encounter has residual effects on how we handle relationships that come into our lives. We handle things differently because of our past experiences or shifts in life. After the shift, can we find hope and love and identify or embrace it? Or has the vacuum effect made us too damaged and angry to embrace them? Ultimately, can we change if we allow it? The Vacuum Effect, Surviving the Shift When It Happens by Thomas E. Walker. On sale 
at all online bookstores.